We will move on to our next demo. It is by a chef born and raised in Washington, D.C., who has a deep understanding of her community. She's worked in the restaurant industry in D.C. for 16 years, began her career at Restaurant Nora, America's first certified organic restaurant. She then moved on to working at other restaurants that supported the farm to table movement in D.C. and New York. She's now consulted for multiple businesses in the food and hospitality industry, including the DCSBDC at Howard University and the business program at the Carlos Rosario Public Charter School. Please help me welcome Carolina Gomez. Okay, I think I'm here now. <laughs> Am I here? Can you see me? Okay, hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's funny, I had prepared this for like a Zoom thing and then this is a different program. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit today about sous vide for small businesses. So my work here in DC, um, I mostly work with small restaurants that are either have been in business for many years or they're micro businesses who are just starting to develop their concepts. And well, I'm just kind of looking at the, at the participants right now and I'm assuming that a lot of you have experience in the restaurant industry and that you are um, currently either chefs in the industry that are designing menus um, or you're looking to open a restaurant. So just out of curiosity, so I know who I'm talking to, if you could put in the chat um, what industry you're in and if you're in business, um, what kind of concept you have. Uh, so I work with lots of different types of concepts from, um, from product to food truck, to food trailers, restaurants, and catering companies. So um, it's cool. I see supper clubs in here. I love supper clubs. I actually have been wanting to start one, but I'm, I've been so tired uh, lately with everything else. But supper clubs are, for me, one of the most amazing uh, ways for chefs to express themselves. So I love that. And catering, um, information technology, scientist, Okay, executive chef for Country Club. So today's presentation, um, I geared toward, well, I was just gonna talk a little bit about what are the advantages of using sous vide for businesses, which I'm sure that if you have some experience, you've already listened to a lot of the same types of things, but I'm gonna talk more about developing your business. I'm trying to figure out now, oh, there we go. Can I share my screen? All right, I'm going to share a presentation, um, but first I have to figure this out. It is, um, I'm, oh, I'm pretty good with technology, but every time I'm using a new virtual thing, it's a new learning experience. So one moment while I share my, um, my screen. This is weird. There we go. Okay, so I think I'm going to have to share my whole screen. Oh, no, here it is. Okay. Voila. Sorry about that. Just like it's always, it's always a learning experience with these new technologies. So I'm hoping you can see me because I cannot see you. <laughs> so, and I can't see myself either. So I'm just going to kind of talk through this and I'm going to finish it quickly. And then at the end, you can ask any questions or we'll do a Q&A. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more. So uh, we, my intro, um, and thank you for that intro, was a little bit more about my restaurant experience. Um, and I have been a small business owner for ever since, I guess I was, so 
11 years, I've owned my own business. Um, and my business now is called Food Biz Mentor. And what I do is I help, like I said, micro businesses um, begin. So we usually write business plans with the business owners and we try to find them their investments. And a big, big part of approaching an investor, it's probably the biggest part of approaching an investor, is to make sure that you're going to make money off of your concept. And that's something that um, it is becoming even more competitive right now, um, just because of the economy and things that we're living um, on getting that investment. So anytime I'm working with a business, I'm looking at the menu, we're developing the menu, and then we're going to see how are we going to make sure that your business is making a profit before you open. And then when they're open, I make sure that the operations are going smoothly and I um, either have to train the team uh, to execute it or uh, they have a team and I can just be a, a backup person reinforcing uh, certain things that we need the business to, um, to, to do. So what I always ask my clients or anybody when I first speak with them is, what do you want your life to look like? And the reason I ask that in the beginning of beginning to work with a client is because I need to know what they want their life to look like to be able to know where the business is going. Um, some business owners are very hands-on and they really, if when they open a food business mostly, they don't want to, uh, they want to work within the business or they want to work on the business for as long as possible. Uh, some don't. Some people want to develop a food business and then they want to either sell it or they want to franchise it. So you have different goals. And each one of those different goals kind of requires a different um, set of advice because different paths required, you know, they, you just, different paths, you create different infrastructure to go through different paths. So the first thing we do is decide what do you want your life to look like and what do you want your business to look like? Um, when it comes to developing the business, I need to make sure that the business owner has their own clear tasks so that they can know what to delegate. So something I wanted to talk about as um, it relates to using sous vide, um, a lot of it has to do with the amount of labor that it really I, I it does save a little bit on labor but more so it helps you with training the team um i i have found that sous vide helps me be able to make sure that everything is consistent that everything's well prepared um and that is a big deal because a lot of cooks get busy they'll forget something in the oven they they overcook a lot uh, unfortunately, and it's something that we try to train. Um, but every once in a while, it happens. But sous vide really kind of eliminates that factor uh, for me. Um, and one thing that I really love about sous vide is for whenever I'm doing a restaurant menu, because then we can have our proteins pretty much ready to go and just finish it whenever we're sending it out. And that not only helps with pickup times, but it helps with training the, the, the team member or the cook on that consistency that you're looking to, to give just because of using the method. Um, so the, whenever we're de developing a menu, which many of you are either consultants or you work with numbers, so you understand this, or even chefs understand this, um, whenever you're designing a menu, you need to first um, develop your recipe and figure out what your food cost is. But what is what are you going to profit off of it? Um, and then after you look at what are you going to profit off the dish, you're also looking at labor and you're looking at what, what, you know, physically <laughs> do people have to do to finish it. Um, and this is whenever um, I started working with sous vide, I had a charcuterie. So we actually did use a lot of sous vide 
Um, and in the, I caught the tail end of the last talk that you were, that you just had, and I saw somebody ask about HACCP plans. And whenever it comes to using or implementing these methods, the health departments do work with businesses on the HACCP plan. Uh, I have a lot of experience writing HACCP plans. Um, and at least the DC government and the Montgomery County government, they really do understand that there is, um, there is an ability to, to make sure that your food is being prepared safely with sous vide. So they, um, I personally, I understand certain health risks sometimes whenever people just, but that happens with any form of cooking if somebody doesn't understand food safety. So as long as you demonstrate the understanding of food safety and you're able to put your procedures in your HACCP plan and the HACCP plan, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but a lot of people don't know, it stands for a hazard analysis critical control point plan. So all you're really doing is telling the health department what do you do to make sure that everything is being kept safely as far as the production goes? And writing the HACCP plan to me is a lot better for me to just write a HACCP plan and get it through with the health department. It might take me maybe two or three back and forth with the health department before they approve it. But once they approve it, I can use sous vide in my restaurant. And when I can use sous vide in my restaurants, everything is better. <laughs> like the food is better. The quality of the food is better. It's more consistent. Um, you can use all kinds of different flavoring methods when you're using sous vide, which I like. I like the fact that the ingredients or the flavors kind of get to penetrate into whatever it is that you're, you're vacuuming. So, you get more to impart more flavor and as you cook it you get to get the advantage of a very controlled cook to where things are so consistent and cooks love it because for them it takes away a lot of the the guesswork or the nervousness that maybe training somebody with less experience someone with less experience always faces that anxiety when they're learning to cook because it's, it's the kitchen and we're moving quickly and we need everything done well. So for many reasons, I've loved using sous vide, but one big thing is this step that I talk about. You, when you're developing your menu, you're not only looking at the menu item, you're looking at how it affects your entire operation. And this is a very great way to standardize a method or an operation and to to just make sure that your foods are being cooked properly and not only that but just your proteins are being consistent uh, which is extremely important so now I'll go to my next slide um, and then one of the biggest things for business owners and chefs I think we're always looking on we're looking to find how we're going to save time we need to save time in as many places as possible because we are busy people. Um, so something I love about sous vide is that I can put it, set it, and then do something else. And I'm not scared that something's going to get go wrong. I'm not um, worried that something is going to be overcooked because I timed it and I know what's going to happen. Um, and that is extremely important uh, for a chef. As far as a business owner goes, a lot of my business owners, I call them my business owners because I work with them so often, but a lot of micro business owners, micro business owners also do a lot of the cooking a lot of the time. Um, many businesses are opened by chefs and sometimes the chefs are self-funding it. So when you're self-funding an operation, you're really filling the task of the chef and the business owner at the same time. And that for me, that is my, um, I mean, that's who I work with mo the most because I like to help chefs create their own concepts. Uh, for me, it's extremely fulfilling, but something that happens is 
chefs don't realize that the business ownership tasks or the administrative tasks are so much larger than just the food tasks that you need to be able to delegate these things. Um, when you're a business owner slash chef, you are one busy person. And for me, there is, I'm always looking for tranquility <laughs> and vacuum sealing and making sure that things are, um, you know, programmed. And then once they're programmed and ready to go, you can just step away. And that is, that, that actually is invaluable. I, I don't know what form of cooking I can just kind of set and leave and know it's going to be perfect and imparts flavor. And if I don't use it all, I can always keep it because it's preserved in the bag. Um, there's nothing else like that. That really is for me what makes sous vide the most special. Um, this is what I just kind of spoke about that you can also chill once it's in the uh, vacuum sealed packets. You can also chill them in the ice bath. You can refrigerate them um, and you can hold the protein in a way that it's not going to deteriorate in quality. It's just well preserved. Uh, something that we do a lot in restaurants is that we'll put the packets on the speed rack and have the portions ready to go and then have extra um, because you, you never know if you're going to get a write up or something happens to where you need more. Um, for me, being able to have a flow of inventory and being able to be able to have that flexibility with my inventory that I don't need to, um, I can prep for the next day or I can, I can manage my production in a certain way that gives me more flexibility is very important to me. Um, put, doing sous vide is nice because it packages everything individually. Um, if I'm not doing sous vide, typically I'm cooking it or braising something or cooking a lot, a big portion of something in a hotel pan. And doing that, and I'm sure if you've, if you've, you've used this method before because most of us do in kitchens where we'll take a braise or we'll take a meat or we'll even do a confit in a hotel pan. And then it's all in there. So now we have to take it out. We have to portion each one of them and then vacuum pack it if we're looking to, to preserve it. But then you're compromising a little bit of the quality of the product because things might break down or things might uh, break apart. So being able to just put them in the packets and put them away very in a neat way um, and then just labeling them and um, dating them, it, it's a big deal as far as inventory. And it sounds so simple. It really does, in my opinion, sound like a very simple thing, but so many people don't do it that I, I do like to tell people a lot about using sous vide in their kitchens. And a big deterrent for some people is the HACCP plan. And that's why I spoke a little bit about that before is because this is such an advantageous method of cooking something for your, for your kitchen. A HACCP plan isn't really an impediment or shouldn't be an impediment if anything, we should be working with our local health departments and um, educating them about what steps it takes to be able to make things um, in, a, in a safe way. Um, and consistency, uh, consistency, I think that's undeniable that sous vide provides <laughs> consistency. It provides it in restaurant dishes as well as catering. And the most crucial place I find it to impact a business is in catering, in catering or in food trucks. Um, for catering, it's so crucial because, and I'm sure if you have a catering company, you know this, catering cooks are difficult to train. Cooking in catering is very difficult to train, mostly because you're changing your menus a lot because 
people, everybody wants a different thing for their event. So if you're designing special menus, your team has to learn new dishes all the time. So what I like to do in my catering menus is I like to have a core menu. Um, this is just a, a list of traditional dishes that I know people love and it's my core menu. And then I, I kind of switch it up sometimes with either the sides or the spices or the sauce combinations to be able to, to make it more unique for each event. But as far as the cooking goes, the, the protein and the method of cooking for the, for the vegetables, those don't change um, in, in my kitchens. So since those don't change, um, the having the sous vide, the ability to like, for example, especially tenderloins, if we're going to take them to an event, being able to make sure that they're so perfectly cooked that all we have to do is sear it there. Um, it saves a ton of anxiety. It saves a lot of time and it makes for much happier customers. Um, people just really always compliment the meat when, when it's sous vide. If it's grilled or something different it still does it goes over very well but um it's not as good as sous vide sous vide just gives it um this tenderness that that is difficult to achieve um on direct heat so greater consistency has been a huge advantage for uh restaurants as far as using it uh using sous vide so for me, the most important things that sous vide brings to the table for the um, for any small business really is that you can integrate herbs and spices and flavors because you're in the vacuum packing method, really sealing that in. Your food can be cooked in central kitchens. So a lot of like chains like Chipotle or I believe Panera Bread and there are others that cook their meats sous vide in a central kitchen and then they distribute it to their different locations and that's incredible i mean that is something that not only standardizes the quality of the cook of your proteins or your your foods even if you don't if you do it with something different it solidifies the consistency of the quality of your food but then it also makes training your team so much easier and training teams is one of the most expensive parts of, um, of developing a business. It's developing your team. It's one of the most labor intensive and expensive steps. So anything you can do to standardize um, the way things are cooked to be able to ensure a high quality, um, it's incredibly important. So that for me is, is a very key, key aspect of sous vide is the fact that you can use this technique to produce the proteins for many different locations in one location and then do the distribution. That is huge. Um, and then the third point is that sous vide is used to lock in juices. Um, just everything is more delicious as far as the way or the texture of the protein. Um, because it's gradually cooking, you're not using any harsh preparation, which is really important for the proteins, which if most people here are chefs, I don't even have to tell you this. This is old news. You already know. Um, but for me, as far as fish dishes go and making sure that my fish is perfectly cooked or even eat beef dishes as well, but a delicate fish or something like, um, I mean, beef definitely, I use it a lot for. It's important. And it's important to lock in those flavors so that whenever I go and sear it, all, all I do is just I add a different level of flavor, but the inside, the inside is so beautifully tender and beautiful and delicate. So I also, a lot of this stuff, I feel like it's re- reiterating or reviewing um, the importance of these simple steps. And they're, they're not, I mean, they're simple because sous vide, you do, you have 
you know, a couple of different methods and techniques, but then you can play around with it so much and you can really use your imagination on what flavors you impart. When do you apply the heat? Do you sear it and then sous vide it? Or do you sous vide it and then sear it? There are a lot of questions there as far as what's best, but the consistency of the cook, uh, the ability to impart flavor, the ability to preserve the food. Um, those are the main factors that I learned, you know, years ago that made me want to start using this in our kitchens and to train small businesses to use sous vide has become a really beautiful part of my life or my journey as a chef because, um, you know, I learned about sous vide 11 years ago or more than that at the Culinary Institute of America. But as I came out into the industry, into the world, and I started meeting small business owners and I started seeing these challenges that they were facing as far as um, food cost, or as far as training, or even seasoning. Um, they face a lot of challenges, and even controlling inventory. Controlling inventory is very challenging for lots of businesses. Um, so sous vide has become a really essential solution for lots of problems. Um, and that's why it's so essential in small businesses. All right, so that was, I kind of sped a little bit through that because I feel awkward not being able to see everybody. Um, and I wanted to leave enough time for questions. So I'm going to close this screen. But if you wanted to reach out to me, um, my Instagram handle, I use Instagram the most. Uh, I also have a website, which is foodbizmentor.com. Um, and then the Instagrams, um, I constantly post business resources on the Food Biz Mentor page. Uh, right now, if, if you're looking to open a food business in Washington, DC, there have been um, certain rounds of funding and grants available in the month of October in DC. Uh, so it's been very nice to be able to, to put those announcements on the Food Biz Mentor Instagram page so people can take advantage of grant funding for their small business um, if you're looking for um, help, and this doesn't just have to do with DC, but if you're looking for small business help, I work with the Small Business Development Center. Um, and Small Business Development Center, the SBDC, is a federally funded program. And the mission of the program is to help people uh, grow and maintain their businesses. Um, and this is help that's for free. It's offered up for free. I work with the DC Small Business Development Center. So I work with the Howard University um, Small Business Development Center. But you have a Small Business Development Center in every state. So I like to spread the word, let everybody know in case you need any sort of business resource. And that is it for me. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm trying to figure out if you can still see me. <laughs> and it looks like you can. <laughs> the said, Take Sorry. It. <laughs> I feel well, like I'm like here a... by yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, that was a great presentation. I love hearing more about how uh, micro businesses and small businesses can really use sous vide to streamline their operations. And uh, there's a lot of benefits from it, as you said. Um, you mentioned small business grants. Where can someone go to search for startup grants? So oof, there are there are different places. So the first place I recommend is the SBDC because your local small business development center has the first, um, I guess they're the first point of entry of, you know, that's the first place where grants are are telling, right? So I work as a chef with the one in DC, but typically small business development centers don't have an in-house chef. So if you're looking for help from your SBDC, just tell them, I'm a food business, I'm looking for grant funding, and they'll give you different options. 
Um, but really that's on the business owner to, to research. And then here in DC, we just launched a portal called Open Access DC. Um, and then that's hosted on the DC SBDC page, which is, I can put that in the chat. It's the dcsbdc.gov. And, um, and the DC, I, I'm going to verify that actually. And then the <laughs> DC, <laughs> um, the DC SBDC, Open Access DC is super cool because if this is the first, first off, this is the first place where Open Access DC decided to launch. And it's a new program that's developed by um, the Aspen Institute's uh, food, um, what is it, the Food Society and Aspen Institute. And so I will share their link. And it's amazing because what they did was that they separated each type of food business. So restaurant, product, food truck, food trailer. And then the business person can go in, click it, and then see all of the criteria and resources available for that type of business. And so it's launched in DC, um, maybe like two weeks ago, and it's going to launch in different major cities around the states um, next. So I think that the next one they're working on is LA. Um, but I'm, I'll put that in the chat right now, but that portal is very cool and we'll put all like available funding options there and just plain old Google research, uh, <laughs> looking for <laughs> federal grants. There are all kinds of grants out there. And I always tell people like, make sure that whatever grant you're applying to, you are okay with the criteria that they're asking of you because sometimes you can get monet, you know, money. So that's good because you get the monetary asset, but now your time is compromised because you have so much reporting to do. So is it worth it? Um, and that's something that you need to kind of decide for yourself as you do the research. I find for my business that, um, there are certain technological grants that have opened up that are very like low maintenance. You don't, you just, they're there to give the business resources, but you don't have to do that much in paperwork. So those are the ones that I usually kind of um, target. So I'll put the link here. I hope that answered your question. It's a big, it's a big can of worms, that, <laughs> that question. I get no, that, that question. Really helpful. There's a book, um, the Kedma O book, um, target funding. I'll put that in the chat as well. Uh, that is an excellent book. If you're looking for, um, to figure out how you're, you know, going to fund your concept, um, because it gives you the strategies and it gives you a checklist of what you need to think about when somebody is, um, you know, looking for funding, because you do have a certain, you do have a certain criteria of information that you have to provide in order, or even just your business has to hit certain marks before people are even interested in investing in it. So that's this book right here that I put, and then I'm going to put in the link to the DC SBDC open access DC page there also in a second. Did you have any other questions while I type? Uh, yeah, what uh, you work with so many different small businesses and uh, like new concepts. What's something that you see? What mistakes do you see people make time and time again when they're trying to think up a concept? Oh, oh, oof. so my <laughs> I'm a very genuine person. I, when I think of something, I definitely wear it on my face. Um, but I've seen so many of the same mistakes. So sometimes it does, you know, um, it's, it's hard. And my first thing would be look for a mentor, look for somebody who can help guide you through because they might most likely have the experience. Um, the biggest mistake is thinking that, you know, what, you know, uh, I think it was when I was reading, uh, Zingerman's delicatessen, which is one of my favorite, uh, food businesses. Um, they did this, uh, this chart where they were talking about being unconsciously incompetent. So not knowing that you don't know something. And sometimes people come in thinking they know so much because 
because you do, right? Like the food business is so vast. Just imagine the, the knowledge that you've gathered in all of those years of experience and practice. But then like, just think about everything you have left to learn. And no matter where you're at in your career, they're just the food business is too, it's, it's, they're, it's just a lot, you know, it's food. And it's one of the biggest industries in, in the world and everybody eats, you know? So the things that you get to learn along the way makes it exciting. And that's why I do what I do. But when somebody comes in and they think that they know everything, that's where I see them make the bit first mistake biggest mistake and usually it has to do with how they're using their um their startup funding actually how are they allocating it um that's one thing because because as chefs we want to use the best ingredients and as chefs we want to put out the best food but when we're going into business we need to do that and have it make financial sense and you can't not make financial sense and still do that because you um, it just won't work. So the first thing is always, okay, how do I make the best quality food with my budget, within my budget, with the money that I have? Then how do I keep growing that pool of money that I'm that I'm making and reinvest it into my into my restaurant in a way that I, I know I have to spend this money on this stuff and how do I strategize growth still? So money, money, and you never have enough money. Um, I've seen people think that $200,000 is a lot of money and it's not like just realistically these days, if you want to open a restaurant in DC, for example, it's like a $2 million endeavor at least. So if you don't have that, it's okay. Like you can still open a business, but then you have to just have that reality check to say, okay, because I only have this pool of money, I have to be super strategic. So that brings me to my next biggest mistake. Write a business plan. Like you write a business plan, you write your own business plan. So a lot of people pay people to write their business plans. And well, I think that's silly because number one, the business plan is an exercise for you to envision and do the research of enacting your business before you actually do it. So only you, the head of the company, um, have the say of how you're going to strategize that. So you should be writing your own business plan. And then the next thing is also the HACCP plan. Uh, like I said before, the HACCP plan is a hazard analysis critical control point plan only you know your critical control points if you're the one managing production. So if you pay for someone to do a HACCP plan, they might charge you like 4,000 bucks and all they're gonna do is ask you to give them the information to put into the document that you're gonna have to send back. So it's like, that's a, it, it's an expense that I feel like the, the chef should definitely know those, those, um, those steps. And if you need help in putting it together, like in a document, you have the DCSBDC. It's a free resource in every state in the country. It's an SBA funded program. Um, and we have the documents. So at that point, it's just about working with the health inspector to get you what you need to do to get approved. But that doesn't require a HACCP plan writer. That requires somebody who understands how to deal with the health department to help get it through. And typically that's going to be a small business development center counselor. Um, and the reason I say these things is because when I opened my first business, I didn't know this, you know, this isn't something you're taught in school. This is something you just learn through experience and life. And you're like, Oh, why did I pay that person if all they did was like, just kidding. So, um, you know, look for your DCSBDC counselors is my biggest thing. I didn't know that that existed when I was first uh, starting my food business. I didn't know that I had that many free resources available. Um, and then I was just reading Mark's comment here. It says level, the levels of um, stages of expertise and that unconsciously incompetent one. That's the that's the most dangerous one. And then when you don't know what you don't know. 
Well, that's the one that is very dangerous. The consciously incompetent one is the most, like the best one. Because you, you know you don't know. So then you go find out. And that's super cool. Um, and then someone says here, how do you streamline your HACCP to eliminate the need uh, to develop a plan for every menu item? Well, so you don't have to write a plan for every menu item. Uh, a HACCP plan is talking about your procedures in a group of products that have similar or the same um, production steps. So what I mean by that is typically you have a core menu um, at a restaurant. You have your, your menu, right? And you can typically divide those menu items between like poultry, seafood, vegetable, uh, uh, ready to eat so you don't have to cook it or cooking it or braising or hot holding. So you, you can typically divide those. They fit in some category. So a HACCP plan, they're asking you to do a chart where you say what you will do for each category, not each menu item. So you don't have to write a HACCP plan for each menu item. And then in the top of the chart, it just tells you what menu items does this apply to. And then that's where you put it. So you're, you're really writing one HACCP plan. You're writing whatever process steps you're using. So in this case, if it was uh, like sous vide, you would have to work through those process steps with your local health department to see what they want to see. But the critical control points happen to be in the vacuum packing, in the temperature window of which you're cooking, um, and then in the cooling and storing. Um, so those are like the main points in the sous vide HACCP plan that you would just identify and say what your corrective action is. And in our case, our corrective action would be pay attention, wear gloves, follow these methods, and make sure that your proteins don't, um, or they stay cool until you're cooking. And then once you're cooking, you're bringing it down to temperature within the, um, the food safe window. Um, so again, if you need help with that, feel free to reach out. Um, I have charts, like, ha like uh, I have the charts, but the charts are diff the charts vary from county to county. So that's why I say go to your health department because something I might give you is not their template. So at that point, you're just gonna have to go to your health department, ask them for the HACCP plan template that they require, and that's when you start filling in those pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm reading through here. It would be written more broadly. Yes, AJ. Yeah, it would be written um, more broadly as far as the HACCP. You can write a program for that, Jason, somebody said. I, I do computer programming, so he was saying I could, um, could probably try to automate that somehow. But thank you, Mark. I appreciate the, the shout out. That would be actually, you should do that um, because <laughs> uh, people need help with how to format TASA plans all the time. So it's cool. And I heard that you were recently on Beat Bobby Flay. Is that correct? And how, what was that experience like? Um, it was great. It airs again on uh, the 27th. So I guess that's on Thursday. And um, it was an excellent experience. Um, as a, you know, I, I've worked every position that exists probably in a restaurant. And um, I worked really, really hard, like my 18 hour or more days. And that, that phase of my life was in my 20s. Once I hit like 30, I was really tired <laughs> physically. And not only hired, but I really loved um, working with other chefs and helping those businesses. So I transitioned. But in my transition, one of the things that hurt the most was the um, not being able to be on the line adrenaline side. Like that for me, and I think for every chef, once you hit around my age, you're transitioning. And that's like our identity crisis, terrible feeling of like, no, <laughs> like I'm not in the kitchen as much anymore. And the bulk of a chef's work is out of the kitchen, not in the kitchen. So doing things like Beat Bobby Flay for me are a, um, 
excellent way for me to be able to just practice and continue growing as that cook, uh, you know, chef that we all, you know, it's funny because we all start our careers and, and fortify our careers with that talent. And then it, you, you set it aside to do like the admin stuff. So um, I love training. So for Beat Bobby Flay, it was an excellent experience. I went with a dish that my mother um, used to do. She used to take like six hours doing it and it really takes a lot of work. So I timed myself a ton and would work at the restaurant trying to get in different environments. And then I like, um, you'll see if you watch the episode how I did, but it was an excellent experience or and, and Bobby Flay was really nice. I really liked him. Um, he kept asking me about how I, you know, why I did certain things in my dishes and about my food, which for me meant a lot because um, when a chef that's very experienced is asking another chef of the why behind something, or they see that you did something that they identified, you know, oh, she did that, but that took thought. That was cool. Um, and then I also got to meet Michael Simon and Esther Choi. And like, I had my deepest respects for both of them. So it was, you know, one of the best days ever of my life. It was amazing. So that's how it went. <laughs> that sounds like a great time. It's great meeting people like that, that you really respect. And then having good experiences with them, it's not always the case. So it's great when it, when they do turn out to be the type of people that you were hoping that they were. At the end of the day, we work with food and I feel like to work with food, Actually, Anthony Bourdain said that um, in an interview once, and it really resonated with me, that if you're somebody who works with food, you have to be someone who cares about something because it takes care to work with food. So if that's like your profession, you're to, you're, you're, you have different dimensions to your personality that I'd like to explore and get to know. Um, so that's what Anthony Bourdain said, and I totally agree. I think if you work with food, you already have this thing um, that no matter who who I meet in the industry, it doesn't matter what they do, um, they're awesome, you know, because of, of that. So I definitely love people who give their, their lives or their professions to promoting, you know, having fun, having, you know, appreciating foods. And then Bobby Flay uses his platform to help highlight um everybody else that's doing it too so for sure that was an excellent experience well chef thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise here's great learning more about what you do and more about how a lot of the chefs and the restaurateurs in the audience can you know take some of these principles and apply it to their own businesses where they can find more information and as you said uh, uh chef Gomez dropped all of her uh her contact information in the chat, and I'm sure she'll do it again. So please reach out if you have questions, if you want to work with her, if you need to learn from her expertise, uh, get in touch with her. Thank you so much, Chef. Thank you so much. And sorry about my awkward virtualness. <laughs> I'm in like, I'm like trying to get used to this virtual. Um, I do this because I don't know. It's like creepy to be like, you're all the way over there. And it's one of the best things about um, the world now. I remember being in the kitchen and just being um, there with my cooks and literally not seeing anybody else in the world to now doing something like what you guys are doing, which is a summit virtually where so many chefs are getting together and talking about how to improve their businesses. Um, it's extremely exciting. So thank you for having me and thank you everybody. I'll put my information in the chat again and just Feel free to reach out to me, especially if you need help with these HACCP plans, because because there's a solution for that. So I'll put my info there. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chef. I really appreciate you spending the time. If you enjoyed the presentation, please give her some love in the comments. It's always great hearing people that are working with a wide range of people because, like she said, there's uh, everyone has different challenges. And when you work with uh, a lot of different small businesses, a lot of different restaurants, and a lot of different concepts, you learn a lot more than any one of those people knows. So it's a 
she's a great resource to lean on. So please don't hesitate to reach out to get more information, especially if you're looking at doing your own thing. It's uh, you don't want to mess up the money side because you can't do any of the the creative great food visions that are in your mind if you don't get a handle on that money side and the HACCP side. So please reach out if you have any questions.